treasury bond for portfolio. So I think the answer is don't require the banks to buy government bonds as a way of making it easy for the government to borrow. Dr. Eichen Green, reading your book, it is obvious that central banks are integral to modern economies, uh, kind of the lenders of last resort. Um, when did central banks, or, or what, however you want to call them going back in history, start to play an important role in public debt? Um, the answer is um, at the beginning. <laughs> or as long as central banks have existed, they have played a role in the market for public debt. So central banks were created as bankers to the government to provide financial services to the government, to advance the government funds when uh, the government was desperate for, for money in order to fight a war or whatever, and then to help the government uh, and uh, place uh, bonds with the public. They acted as underwriters, if you will, for public debt. What an underwriter does is advance money to the borrower and then market the bonds. And if it's a private underwriter, take a cut in of the revenues in response, in, in, in return to, for providing those services. So in the case of central banks, rather than taking a cut of the revenues, they might get other privileges as recompense like yeah properly on the on on issuing currency or something like that so it has always been the case that central banks act as bankers to the government um and uh it's still the case to a more limited extent today um the story of central banks which you say goes back to the beginning if if you know you can go back to Italian families that acted as banks, although not central banks to other nations, um, and 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 move move forward in history, banks such as Bank of England or the first and second banks of the United States. The the interesting, the funny thing about them is that they were actually private entities. Well, pseudo private entities, I guess. How did that work? Like, how can you have someone that wants to make a profit help the nation? Isn't there a conflict of interest inherently baked it, in there? It, it's a very complicated relationship. So I, I, I would remind you that the Federal Reserve System today has private shareholders. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. Our Fed has private shareholders? The Fed today has private shareholders. Um, the uh, member banks Oh, okay. Hold shares in the Federal Reserve, but you know what they can vote on and what they can decide is limited. Just like in a private corporation today, you have uh, different classes of shareholders with different voting and control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rights. Uh, the same has is is true of the Fed, and uh, was even more true in, in, in past cases where central banks were purely private entities, where there was the understanding that the government would take them over if they didn't uh, mainly uh, pursue policies that were in the public interest. So oh, I see. This, that this implicit threat, threat over there, right? In the background that, that, that basically uh, dictated that... Uh, there, there were certain understandings about what was in the public interest, and even a private bank that was banker to the government that had monopoly privileges on note issue uh, would, would not abuse those privileges. Um, when it comes to central banks, I'm a bit bashful to ask this question. It may, it may sound too silly and too rudimentary, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, you know, reading your book, this, this I came across this several times, but I, it, it doesn't even have to be your book. You can read the Wall Street Journal today where the Fed buys bonds floated by the U.S. Treasury and other central banks, so to speak, do that. They're, they buy their own nation's debt. <laughs> to a layperson like me, I'm not an economist. Isn't that like 
taking money out of one pocket and stuffing it into the other pocket at the end of the day is the nation's debt. How does how does that help? How does that grease the wheels? Well, so um, it greases the wheels by um, providing in, in ensuring that the interest rate the government faces will be lower than otherwise because there's an additional investor, a big investor to buy the government's bonds, namely the central bank. I'll, I'll give you a couple uh, uh, of additional answers. I see the perplexed look on your face. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Technically, the way the Congressional Budget Office and the U.S. Treasury think about this is that if U.S. Treasury bonds are bought by the Social Security, Security Administration or another branch of government, they're, they're not counted as debt held by the public, debt in the hands of the public, because it's just debt that the, the government issues and the government absorbs and the two cancel out. However, debt held by the Federal Reserve is counted as debt in the hands of the public. So why we treat these things differently, one answer would be ask the Treasury and, 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 uh, <laughs> and, and the other public accountants and the but CBO, I, yeah. I, I I think the answer is that um, uh, when the when the uh, the the Fed doesn't always remit profits to the government, so when the Fed earns interest income on the government bonds that it holds, it can turn around and 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 use those profits for different things like backing for the loans that it provides to banks in need and so forth. I'm not sure that was a terribly clear or convincing answer, but the uh the the the, the way this matter is treated in the United States is that the the Fed is not regarded as simply another pocket or branch of government from this point of view, but um uh other um branches uh, uh, of government like the Social Security Trust Fund are. So when Social Security holds government bonds, those, uh, that debt and those investments basically cancel out. Yeah. So the debt held by the Social Security Trust Fund, for example, is not debt held yeah. by um, uh, Fannie and Freddie, I think, is not, but debt he held by the Fed is counted as debt in the hands of the public. So if you look at the statistics, there are two, two numbers out there, total debt of the federal government and debt of the federal government held by the public. And oh, wow. And the latter includes debt held by the Fed, excludes debt held by entities like the Social Security Administration. You appreciate how complicated this is. It's more complicated every minute we talk. <laughs> um, in your book, you, you you warn a lot, quite a bit. There's a lot of different uh, anecdotes, passages uh, that warn about involvement of private banks in public debt. Uh, on one of the pages, you, uh, I forget the context, but I'll read it. It says, relying on the banking system for policy implementation is just a bad thing. Yet here we are, all all banks, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, B of A, name him, and I'm sure it's the same in Europe, own US debt. Is there a specific type of debt or a specific type of involvement that your book talks about? Or is this just a general sort of blanket statement for everything? No, it it it, it it's a statement about holding uh excessive amounts of public debt and not hedging the interest rate risk. Silicon kind of like so, yeah, there you go. Was, uh, is the paradigmatic case in point where it experienced basically a fourfold increase in its deposits between 2018 and 2022, and it didn't know where to park all this money. Uh, it couldn't find good places to in, in, invest it or lend it, so it parked it in treasury bonds. And then uh, in its wisdom, it took off the interest rate hedges that it had purchased previously. This was a way to goose profits 
yeah. in the short run. And one might think a way to goose CEO pay and bonuses. And <laughs> then when interest rates rose, it got hammered by uh, losses on this big treasury bond portfolio, uh, unhedged treasury bond for- portfolio. So I think the answer is don't require the banks to buy government bonds as a way of making it easy for the government to borrow. Um, I see. Attach appropriate risk weights to investments in government bonds. So I was in India two weeks ago, and I I, I learned that the risk weights on state government bonds in India are zero, which oh. is contrary to best practice internationally, what everybody says one should do, but this is a way of making it easier for the states to borrow at lower interest rates. And it can come back to bite you if it causes the banks to load up on government bonds because they don't have to put aside capital in order to uh, back provide backing against the possible risks. So going um, back to your book, in current state of India, as in their financial affairs, uh, if India's public debt, national debt goes sour, it'll, it may just completely demolish the banking system too. Pri- yeah. pri- go ahead, please. So um, India's uh, uh, overall government debt to GDP ratio, public debt to GDP ratio is on the order of 90% now only a little bit below that in the US. People there are not troubled by the fact because India is growing at six or 7% a year. So it's growing the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio much much faster than we are able to do. But if it slows down, then you have an issue, right? Then you have an issue. and And to the extent that this debt is disproportionately held by banks, insurance companies and pension funds, there are important institutional investors who could quickly find themselves in in in, in trouble under those circumstances. So I oh boy did a paper on this a couple of weeks that was presented a couple of weeks ago with a uh, a couple of co-authors uh in India and uh that was our message. Don't be so sanguine about a issue that is uh, treated as a non-problem in the Indian press. We're representatives of the Indian government sitting there listening to you. They were, <laughs> you know, and, and ju- just because uh, the message is sent uh, doesn't necessarily mean that the message is received. Let's take a break here. Stay with me and Dr. Eichen Green as we get into the perspective. <laughs> 